So uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Steve Rosansky, President and CEO of the Newport Beach Chamber of Commerce. And I wanna welcome you to our Government Affairs Committee meeting for the month of March. Um, we're still on Zoom. Hope to get back in person and meet somewhere so you could have actually met Kevin and, and shook his hand instead of having to virtually shake it. But um, I think it'll, uh, it'll do for today. I, I'm sure he's got a great uh, program, a great discussion about uh, what he does here in town as far as um, his duties as the fire marshal and fire safety and some things that have been in the news recently as well as some uh, things that may not have been in the news hopefully because we always like to get the inside scoop at our government affairs committee meeting. So I'll just remind you that uh, this is a webinar so you uh, if you do have questions and he will be uh, answering questions at the end of his um, discussion please put them in the Q&A box don't put them in the chat box Put them in the Q&A box. It's a lot easier for us to monitor them, them there. Um, and um, at the end of his discussion, in the Q&A session, we'll have updates from several of our legislative representatives' offices about things that are happening in uh, Santa Ana, Sacramento, and over maybe even in the Capitol, so, uh, or the United States Capitol. So with that being said, I'm going to turn this over to Alberto, and he's going to be introducing our speaker. Take it away, Alberto. Good morning. <clears throat> I got a frog this morning. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for joining us. Uh, thank you, Steve. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm looking down the list here, see some great friends that are joined us. Goran, my colleague from campus, uh, who heads up our CEO roundtable, has joined us, I see. Uh, and believe it or not, he's uh, my half marathon partner. Uh, out of the blue, uh, saw him at a half marathon. So Kevin, uh, welcome. Uh, Kevin Bass is a third generation Californian, born in LA and grew up in Yorba Linda. Kevin attended Cal State Fullerton, go Titans, graduated in 1989. By the way, Titans are going to the big yes. dance on yes, Friday yeah. against well, Duke. It's gonna be a tough game. He majored in history and geography, urban planning, graduating with two degrees. He was hired uh, by the city of Anaheim as a city planner and spent the next 13 years managing projects, conducting plan reviews and preparing reports for the city planning commission and council. Kevin accepted the assistant fire marshal position at OCFA where he was responsible for overseeing plan review, inspection and administrative staff members while providing fire prevention services to 23 cities and the unincorporated areas of Orange County. As a resident of one of those unincorporated areas, thank you, Kevin. He also served as an elected board trustee for the Fullerton School District from 2002 to 2006. So you're the honorable Kevin Bass. Once upon a time. <laughs> Kevin worked for OCFA for 16 years before accepting the fire marshal position at Newport Beach. He enjoys paddleboarding in Newport Harbor, Back Bay, watching the Anaheim Ducks, training his German short hair pointer, and hiking the trails in Osu. Kevin is honored to serve the city of Newport Beach and maintaining a safe and prosperous community. Kevin, thank you for joining. We're looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I, I always enjoy uh, getting out there and uh, sharing what we do here at, uh, at Fire Prevention. Uh, everybody loves their firefighters, and uh, I could see why they uh, they look good in their uniforms and in their turnouts. But uh, I think we do some really important stuff here in fire prevention. <clears throat> fire prevention is where we get to show our stuff in terms of um, how we uh, serve our community and how we help uh, people with their particular projects and uh, businesses and such. So I'm going to go ahead and start my uh, presentation. see there we go so the fire prevention division we are committed to safety and prosperity we do both because without being prosperous there's not a whole lot for me to do um, my staff and i are very solution oriented we don't just look at the code and what it says we look at what it means and how it applies to meeting the needs of our community my staff and i are very proud to serve the the citizens of Newport Beach and we we just 
we just always are here at work, just ready to do our thing. So I'm gonna go over the uh, different sections of my team and the services that we provide. Uh, first is plan review. The plan review team is the people you see at the public counter. They review your plans, answer your questions. They help you with the technical aspects of your projects. Uh, if you're a business, you're doing tenant improvements in your building. Uh, you're a homeowner, you want to build a new home. You wanna do tenant improvements. You wanna build some things out in the high fire hazards here. My plan review team, they're there to help you. And they are uh, really, really dedicated to turning things over fast. <clears throat> I have two construction teams. The new construction team are the people who go out kind of like building inspectors. They're out there uh, helping to make sure that it's built according to plans and code, but they're also there to help in terms of what you see in the three-dimensional world as opposed to what you see just on flat paper. They uh, work with the trades and the contractors to get things done. We are very quick to turn around requests for building inspections or, uh, and also re-inspections. It's very fluid out in the field. So uh, my team just takes it upon themselves to schedule as fast and as quick as possible. Then I have my other inspection side, which is the annual inspection side. This is the side that people don't like to see. <laughs> this is where we come to your uh, buildings and uh, walk with you to say how things are going, making sure that uh, any fire life safety systems you have are being maintained and they're operating like they're designed. <clears throat> they're also there to help you in terms of questions on fire safety, where the threats are for your business. If you have a uh, restaurant, we worry about your cooking. If you have a church, we worry about your exits. If you have a motorcycle dealership, we always wanted to look at a test drive. So um, we're always here to, to help, but there are some inspections we absolutely have to do because the state fire marshal says we have to. We always have to go to schools, high rise buildings, uh, jails. Luckily we only have one, but um, there are some things we absolutely have to do. So during the pandemic, we, um, we scaled back some of our inspections. You're gonna see us out a little bit more in force this year. Then I've got my wildland mitigation team. They're, they're the team that goes out and deals with the wildland stuff. Now, it doesn't sound reasonable, but almost a third of the city is in the high fire zone. And because of that, that impacts a lot of property owners, particularly in the Newport Coast area and parts of uh, uh, Corona Del Mar. They uh, have their homes. We have landscaping responsibilities. We have uh, inspection responsibilities, making sure vegetation is pulled back from the house trying to uh, educate people on what they can do to harden their house, uh, looking at things that we can do in terms of helping real estate agents get their inspections done so they can go ahead and finish their uh, projects and get that, uh, that sale done. Also, um, we're out there to go and do presentations and inform HOAs and homeowners what they can do protecting themselves, where their evacuation routes are, all the fun things that go with living in a, in a beautiful area, but it is a high fire area. So for 2022, now that we're kind of emerging out of uh, COVID, we're gonna be out doing some really interesting things. It's kind of interesting in the sense that building never really slowed down during the past year and a half. The public counter was closed, but plans were submitted. My team was busy all the time. Even when they had to work at home, they were always busy. But we've got a lot of projects that are coming through. One of the big ones is a new high rise building. Haven't done one in quite a while. So this is gonna be a, a learning experience for some of my team members, but it's gonna be real, real nice. Um, hopefully you've seen some of the, uh, some of the uh, preliminary renderings, and it is going to be a gorgeous building. But there's also a number of other projects that are going to be coming through, uh, helping with those arena numbers, uh, getting those uh, dwelling numbers up to help uh, our housing element. Also, 
we're going to have new fire codes, building codes adopted in uh, at the end of this year and ready for 2023. That's actually quite a bit of work. There's a lot of changes in the code, particularly when it comes to solar panels and their battery systems. Uh, new uh, wildland codes. It's it's going to be it's going to be quite extensive, and I'm hoping to. Uh, find a way to uh, take code language and make it into a uh, uh, non-code language uh, method so we can all understand it. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, we're also uh, working with our uh, wildland communities to create a fire safe council and adopt firewise community standards. There's a lot of um, issues going on throughout the state, particularly with the insurance industry and people are having either uh, incredible rate increases or they're seeing their insurance canceled altogether. One of the things the insurance industry wants to see is a, is a co comprehensive method of protecting properties so that the risk is reduced to the point where they can be uh, ready to issue uh, insurance policies or maintain the policies that are out there. So this is a, a very focused uh, uh, project of my, my team and myself for this year. <clears throat> and then we also have the Ready, Set, Go and other wildland uh, mitigation programs. We saw the, uh, the fire that was in Emerald, uh, Emerald Bay area, <clears throat> which is uh, pretty close to us. Uh, we also had the fire uh, a couple of years ago, they call it Santiago, but it was in Irvine, Portola area. And we want to make sure that we have a fire in that area that we have the same result, which is no homes lost. So we got our work cut out for us to do, and we're, we're here to get that launched. Uh, segwaying into the Emerald Fire, which is over in Laguna Beach, the Emerald Fire was a wood-driven fire in the native vegetation. I talked to OCFA, and it turned out that they had some money to help the residents with some of their fuel modification, which is specialized landscaping. And with that, they were able to get it back under repair. And that was very timely because then the fire hit it and essentially the fire laid down or there, you didn't have direct flames hitting the homes. Um, <clears throat> embers were blowing through the neighborhood, but we had the uh, firefighters knocking them down. So we didn't have any uh, damage to the homes in the uh, in the two neighborhoods affected, but uh, it was it was interesting. You had both a Santa Ana wind event coming through as well as a coastal influence coming through, which kind of met in that area. That's why you kind of had that push for the fire actually coming towards Newport Beach. It just goes to show that Mother Nature is never predictable. I guess I should already know that, but. It, it was a very interesting uh, wind event, and both OCFA and I are discussing how that works for our, uh, other uh, wildland projects uh, for Irvine and for us. As of right now, we don't have a determination of cause. It's still being investigated by OCFA. <clears throat> if I hear anything, I will pass it along. Now, we did have an, a little fire out in the uh, Back Bay area over by um, Park Place, uh, Park Newport Apartments. That one was a cigarette driven fire. And we're, we're lucky that there wasn't a, 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 a strong ocean influence in terms of blowing the, uh, the, the fire up. Um, fire likes to run with the wind and it also likes to run uphill. So in this instance, a strong ocean wind would have blown that up. It wouldn't have probably had direct flame hitting the buildings, but it could have started some other spot fires with embers blowing through. That's why um, we're gonna be working with Park Newport. They've been doing a pretty good job of uh, clearing their uh, vegetation. But <clears throat> in this area, we also have other agencies, both state and federal. So it's, it's tricky when you're dealing with uh, natural vegetation that has protected status. So with that, it's uh, just a brief overview of my uh, 
fire prevention team. We're here to, to help. And in terms of this presentation, I will, um, I will forward it over to uh, Steve and uh, he should be able to send that out uh, to anybody who really wants it. Well, that's great. That's a really good uh, overview. You could probably um, stop the screen share now so we can get a good look at it. There we go. <laughs> so yeah, so you covered a lot of ground there. Um, I know we had a couple questions here in the Q&A. So why don't we hit those first? And I think the second one you just answered, you will provide a copy of the slide deck. So um, if anybody wants it, just uh, reach out to me and I'm happy to forward it on when uh, Kevin sends it. And then um, the other question here we have is, I'd like to speak to you regarding adding the wetlands and wildlife care network to the incident command system for fire response under wildlife recovery. So is that incident command system, is that a countywide thing or a city thing? And why would they wanna be part of that? So usually when we have a unified command, that's usually going to be a a decision that's made by who is going to lead the incident and bring other agencies together. For example, the unified command for the Emerald Fire was driven by <clears throat> OCFA, Orange County Fire Authority, but it included Newport Beach Fire. It also included um, other agencies like uh, Edison and uh, the County Parks Department. So if we have a fire that is in a wildland area, we do usually inter, uh, connect with the agency that is uh, responsible for that group. Uh, recently, <clears throat> there was a fire in the Santa Ana River, which is also a protected waterway. So we had the, um, uh, we had the Orange County uh, Water Board, we had the Army Corps of Engineers because they have responsibility. We had the, um, uh, state Fish and Game and Federal Fish and Wildlife. So all of those agencies were part of the unified command. Um, <clears throat> when we had the oil spill, we also had them uh, participating as well as part of the unified command. So depending on the emergency itself is when it, they start looking at the agencies who are going to be directly impacted by both the event and the recovery of the event. Um, you know, it's like those commercials where you have the, uh, the oil slick and we have the uh, animals and birds uh, who are taken care of. That's a directed effort by those types of agencies. So we are, we are coordinating with those agencies when an incident comes through. Um, that also includes the wetlands. As you remember, we had the booms that were out to protect the Chico wetlands when we had that oil spill off of uh, Huntington Beach. Uh, <clears throat> but every individual event is different. So it, it pulls the agencies that they think they need. Sometimes they oversee them. So it's, it's one to have a reminder that if you see something and you don't hear, just go ahead and speak up. Well, it would seem like wetlands and wildlife, I mean, especially in both of those incidents, all the incidents you talked about, there's wildlife and marine life that uh, would have been affected that they might have been able to help with and you know as far as the, the creatures <laughs> not so much yeah, the people yeah. but uh, although maybe those two i don't know if they yeah. help with the dogs and stuff i guess that's probably <coughs> animal control that would uh you know help with things like that but i've, I've always wanted to do the uh the the dawn commercial where you get to uh take a you know one of those birds with the oil slick and you know get to wash them and clean them up and, oh, yeah. <laughs> and release them but I never got that lucky. Yeah, well, you're probably busy doing other things. <laughs> uh, looks like uh, we have another question here. When will the Emerald Bay Fire Ignition um, Source be issued? Uh, so do we know how that fire started? So we don't have any information at this time. Orange County Fire Authority has an investigation team accessing records, looking at video cams, looking at uh, uh, taking taking information and evidence from all sorts of uh, sources. They haven't come to a conclusion yet. And because it's very close to utility lines, I am, I, I, I'm going out on a limb here, but I'm thinking they're gonna be really careful to have all their ducks in a row before they really make a statement on who or what was responsible for the ignition of that fire. Just, uh, there's just so much at stake 
that comes through on something like this, particularly with the other fires that have been started by utilities. They want to make sure it's done right and it's something that can stand up in court because you know it's going to be challenged. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, certainly the um, up in Northern California, those utility, uh, basically electric lines, not mm -hmm. utility lines, are a significant um, source of uh, fires, uh, you know, how they start. Uh, Alberto, you want to take one of these or? Yeah, well, uh, I'm going to add one if I can. Okay, sure. Um, you know, <clears throat> Uh, you, you touched on uh, solar panels and batteries now that uh, folks are installing at home. Uh, the increase in technology use, right? Everyone has a phone or an iPad. Uh, everyone's plugging into the wall. Um, are, are you seeing an uptick of challenges around that in terms of uh, ignition points that uh, uh, both residential and on the commercial side? <clears throat> well, we are seeing a tremendous uptick in the number of solar panels and battery systems, both for residents and commercial businesses. Uh, a lot of it has to do with green codes or the building codes that require a, a certain amount of your energy to be produced on site. Um, one thing we're lucky is, is that the uh, ion battery, lithium ion battery uh, industry has taken it taking a couple of shots for um, fires that have occurred. If you remember the Samsung uh, phones and those batteries not being yeah. allowed on airplanes and uh, computers where those lithium ion batteries uh, ignited. So they've, they've really upped their game in terms of quality control. Um, we are not experiencing battery fires in homes but it's still a new industry. I've only had three or four years of that type of activity. Uh, the old nickel uh, cadmium lead acid batteries, you can still use, they just take up a lot more space. You, you've seen the Tesla power walls, they're, they're almost like art. I mean, it's very, very flat, very thin, it stores a lot of energy, but there are some hazards that come with those type of batteries. Um, if you have it outside, you've reduced some of the risk, but some people want to put those batteries on the inside. And the problem is if they go, um, they tend to not just become big power uh, releases in terms of energy. They also put out toxic smoke. So those smoke alarms are really important. You want to get out of the, uh, the house as soon as possible. But um, we just aren't experiencing that many uh, fires from them other than small batteries like uh, the little hoverboards, uh, the batteries for remote control vehicles and such, um, even some of the electric ba uh, bikes. But even those are infrequent considering how many devices are out there. We're not getting that many. I'm actually more worried about cooking fires than I am about battery fires. Mm -hmm. But those are the kinds of things with the emerging technology that goes to show that our codes can't keep up. So we have to think outside the box. We talk to everybody. Orange County Fire Marshals has a group working on a kind of like a countywide standard so we can process these requests as fast as possible. Okay, so um, Warren Fellison wants to know about the recording. Yes, we are recording it and it will be on our website at newportbeach.com in the next <clears throat> couple of days. So. Look for it there if you want to access it uh, again. And then Pierce Swan's got a couple of questions that are basically the, uh, similar. Um, the first one was, what authority do you have in high fire areas to keep combustible fuel away from homes? And what steps have you taken in Newport Coast to protect it? There are many pines and other flammable trees throughout the community and many even touching homes. And I will say that when I was a city councilman, and this is almost nine years ago now, and, or started 20 years ago, if that was a frequent um, source of, of friction, I guess, the, with the homeowners there on Buck Gully and now up in Newport Coast, um, you know, and maybe some, a couple other little areas around town that, you know, you guys come in and say, hey, you got to cut back your landscaping. And, and they say, hey, this is what, you know, we, we like the landscaping, we don't want to cut it back. So what's your authority there and, and how do you kind of navigate those uh, situations? So the authority to the uh, local fire departments is from the health and safety code, public resource code, the government code, 
which all kind of wraps up in the fire code. So with that, we have a lot of authority in terms of in the wildlands to put something together in terms of vegetation from homes. Now, the, the problem is, is how is it defined? It's defined as vegetation or natural vegetation from the structures. So if we take uh, Buck Gully, for example, it's really the homes that are abutting Buck Gully. Those are the ones that I have the authority to go in and say, you must have 30 feet of reduced vegetation. And then from 31 to 100 feet or to your property line, 50% uh, 50, 50 reduction. Okay, that means I have to work with the property owners to figure out how this works because they're also on very steep hillsides. I can't just tell them to take it down to bare earth because at that point I'm introducing the possibility of erosion and slope failure. And with the homes right next to the slope, the possibility exists of losing homes. So I do have to work with the homeowners. I have to work with uh, geologists and landscapers to find a balance point in terms of reducing the fire load, but also protecting the land itself so we don't lose homes. Newport Coast, that has some history. Newport Coast was developed under the rules of Orange County Planning and Orange County Fire Authority. They had the responsibilities of the development as it was transferred over to the city during the annexation. So with that in mind, the fuel modification landscape, the belt of specialized landscaping that goes uh, around the perimeter was the, uh, the new thinking back in the uh, 90s and early 2000s. And fuel modification is great in terms of a wall of fire coming up towards the community. It really stops it in its tracks and it makes a big difference. Um, the problem is, is that at that time, the fuel modification landscape plant palette allowed for pine trees. It allowed for specific types of pine trees, stone and Aleppo, I remember. <clears throat> and uh, not to say anything derogatory to the Irvine Company, but when they develop, they like a very pretty landscape, which means they put in a lot of material, including trees. And in the beginning, those trees were small. It covered a lot of area. Now those trees are overlapping. And I do agree with the homeowners that there's too many of them. I am working with some groups right now in terms of opportunities to remove those trees. The trees are maintained by the city in specific areas, but they belong to the HOA. So it's up to the HOA to decide how they wanna manage their landscaping. If the HOA wishes to remove trees, they coordinate with me and uh, another colleague from Public Works, Kevin Picard. We've probably heard his name out there. And we work with you in terms of how those tree removal proposal would work. And we are going to be very helpful in those uh, requests. The problem is, is that I need to get a request first before I can say, okay. Um, any kind of planting that goes behind it has to comply with today's plant palette and forestry mechanisms, which would widely space those trees and would not allow pine trees. So there's a lot of work that I'm working with uh, uh, select people out in the uh, master association to see what we can do. But you are correct, Steve. There are a number of residents who do wanna keep their Italian cypresses. It, uh, it completes their Tuscany look. Those things are like Roman candles, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are. They have such a high oil content. It, it's a birthday candle on a yeah. big scale. Yeah, they're nasty once they get that big. They're got all kinds of dead stuff in the center of them. Well, I see Dennis Brass has been typing away. Have you mastered that question? <laughs> well, I, may, maybe, let's see. So, I think you got to summarize a little it, bit there. It, yeah, so um, he, he wants to know, the interest by insurance companies looking to you and others for suppression mechanisms uh, to fight fires quickly, big fires, right? He points out the state that the state legislature through our assemblywoman 
uh, brought in some money for OCFA, bringing in uh, that big Chinook. I think it's partnered with Edison mm-hmm. uh, to fight fires. So his, his question are, is, uh, are these tools, assets, technology helping you guys out? And can you chat about it and how these tools can prove to insurance companies that the Newport Beach Fire Department and OCFA are ready? Well, Orange County Fire Authority and Newport Beach, Laguna Beach, Huntington Beach, all of us are very much integrated. They, they practice a lot together. Um, the Air Fleet is, is Orange County Fire Authority. They have two helicopters that are up all the time and another two that are back up. Plus we have the Unified Command uh, Chinook helicopter which is over at the joint training uh, base in Los Alamitos. We even have um, Orange County Sheriff's uh, helicopters that are training to do quick water drops if OCFA for whatever reason isn't available. So there are a lot of uh, resources that are built. In addition to air, there's also a lot of ground crews. Um, OCFA has two dedicated wildland hand crews to do work. And they are not just doing the work during the fire, they're also doing work during the season to help clear breaks and such to help with future fires. We also have uh, two or three uh, dozer teams that go out and cut breaks during a wildfire and work during the season. So there's a lot of equipment and personnel to what I would call on the operational side work on the fire scene and prepare for the fire scene. Um, the insurance industry, and I've, I've been attending a lot of the California Department of Insurance meetings, the insurance industry is a for-profit business. And they've taken a bath this last several years, particularly in <clears throat> North and, uh, North and Central uh, California. The fires in Southern California, particularly the last three, haven't had really any significant loss. The, the, the Santiago fire, the Bluebird fire, and the Emerald fire, it's, I think we lost one home. The fire before that, uh, the Canyon 2 fire, which started up by the 91 and came down the 241, that one we lost, I believe, 50 homes, and it was over 20,000 uh, acres. It was a big fire. And the areas that were destroyed were actually much older areas up in the Anaheim Hills, um, Orange area. So we've made a lot of improvements and we've really reduced the amount of homes damaged and destroyed since that 2003 freeway complex fire that uh, hit Anaheim and Yorba Linda pretty bad. The the problem is, is that the insurance industry is just very conservative. So we're trying to build relationships with them and find out what it is that they need in order to get that comfort level back to show that it is a place to provide the insurance service. And the uh, Commissioner Lara is pushing a rates exchange public hearing that uh, is going to incorporate some of these um, bridge building concepts with the insurance industry on what will help them get back into the field and provide service. One of those things is fire safe councils. The other one is fire wise communities control the vegetation next to the homes. After the fuel mod break, embers is the big issue. If we can get homeowners to provide that five foot buffer around their house, keep their roof clear of leaf litter, um, that goes a long ways to protecting the home. The problem we're running into is once a house catches on fire, it's not one house, it's a minimum of three, the house and ones on either side. So unless you have large side yards, those houses, when they burn, put out a lot more energy than brush. So we're trying to protect the whole community from even starting. The problem is it takes a whole community to put together a comprehensive program to protect its entire organism. And that's, that's the new thinking that we're trying to uh, get our, our, our heads wrapped around and then get that word out to our communities. 
Yeah, getting everybody on the same page is not always. Uh, <laughs> well, we all have we all have needs, and we do love our homes. When I was on city council, I said if you can get eighty percent of the people to agree on anything, it's a home run. So oh, yeah. the other twenty percent that their houses are going to, you know, uh, uh, mess it up for the rest. So I, I have another question. You you uh, mentioned about the that uh, Ritz Carlton uh, residences project down the uh, down the line here. Actually, I didn't. I didn't really realize that that was out in the public yet, but I guess it is. <laughs> um, it is today, and yeah. then um, and that's going to be over there by uh, the the newly or soon to be reopened uh, Vea Hotel. The Marriott's transformed into Vea, and it's supposed to be quite spectacular, from what I hear. And so I I guess the last large building that was constructed there in Fashion Island was probably the Pimco building, if I recall, um, and that's probably similar size and scope as what they're talking about, but. You know, that is kind of a sort of a one off thing. It's not like building a house or maybe a small commercial building. So do you do you bring in like outside plan checkers and, and things like that that have maybe you know more experience and expertise with projects like that? Or is that something that would be done in house as far as I like to fire take, safety aspects of it? I like to take the big projects, the important projects that are for the city and keep it in house. That way. I have more oversight on it. It gives me an opportunity to teach and grow my staff and give them the opportunity to learn even more about their crafts. At that point, I'd be using consultants to take a little bit more of the day-to-day -day stuff, mm -hmm. such as tenant improvements over at Fashion Island or new restaurants that are uh, <clears throat> modifying uh, some of their floor space areas. Um, or, you know, maybe, you know, some of the single family homes that are being built, you know, some of the, it, it's amazing how many of these homes were taken down and rebuilt out in the peninsula area. Um, I, I, I'm just amazed when I came here to Newport Beach, how many elevators you have in your homes. <laughs> it's, it's quite interesting. I, I'd never seen that many before. But uh my, my direction is to grow my staff in terms of their capabilities so that eventually when I go, my staff is ready to step in and teach the new people who get hired. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the more my staff is, is uh, professionally developed, the more they can help the business owners and homeowners with their really creative designs. They, they really push the boundaries of code Mm -hmm. And uh, we look for solutions, but you really got to know your stuff in order to be that creative. So um, I've got more questions. Do you, do you have any, Alberto? I've got a, I wrote out a list here. No, go ahead. Okay. So, uh, well, you, you actually segue nicely into another question that I had. So, yeah, there is a lot of remodeling projects in town. Some are, you know, they build from the ground up. I, and my understanding is the new codes now do require fire sprinklers in certain situations in homes, um, much like a commercial property. So, so if you have a house that you're just going to, let's say, or a property that you're going to just remodel and not ground up construction, is there a certain percentage or how do you determine whether now okay, you have to go back and retrofit for um, sprinklers? Because that could be a fairly significant expense in a home or any <coughs> type of project. Uh, sprinklers cost about four to six dollars a square foot. So your average house that, I, that I've been seeing about four thousand square feet, mm -hmm. it would be twenty four, twenty five thousand um, <clears> dollars. <throat> most new homes, it's a, it's an automatic. It's a new home. It's required to have sprinklers. Right. Take an existing home and you're going to refresh it. You're going to add on a, you know a thousand square feet or so. Um, as long as it's two stories and it's less than 2,000 square feet and less than 50%, you're fine. You don't need to put the sprinklers in. 2,000 square feet total square footage or 2,000 feet of an addition? Addition. Okay. Actually, it, it's actually in our code. And if anybody has questions or would like a, a copy of that snippet, I can send it over. Um, the problem is most of the people want to go to a third story. Mm. <clears throat> Once you hit three stories, you're gonna you're required to have sprinklers. So is that like the little? Because really, our our for most areas in town, the building codes wouldn't allow. Or you could there's not enough height to get to the third story, but 
some of them kind of bootstrap in like a half a third story or they call it a some kind of room so in that case you you'd be talking about a third story right okay so once once we hit three stories we're stuck it's it's a it's a sprinkled situation mm -hmm. but um I'm, I'm finding that a lot of people are able to get that flatter roof uh flatter pitch roof in order to meet that maximum height requirement mm -hmm. and they're able to sneak in that third story mm -hmm. which is really nifty because you have that third story and then you have your roof deck which is your outdoor yeah. rec area and that's your ocean know, view. some of the views of these homes yeah. i don't blame them yeah. um so you know with that in mind you know it's a trade-off i want people to develop the homes they want sprinklers are cost but in terms of total cost of the project it's a very small percentage so and when they do like it does trigger the sprinkler requirement is it just for the addition or the entire house then it would be the entire house retrofit it. okay yeah. Um, well, let me see. I guess I have one sort of last question, and I, I don't know how much it impacts here in town, but we did talk about, you know, pine trees and things in Buck Gully or wherever out in Newport Coast. And, and I know in a lot of areas um, in California, the one of the big problems they have is um, uh, insects and things killing the trees or killing the, the vegetation like bark beetles or things like that. Do we have those issues around here at all? Is that something that concerns you or? Right now, we don't have that issue. We don't have the golden shot borer beetle or other boring insects. Um, I have been working with the uh, forestry group. There is a forestry division with OCFA, and they bleed over into uh, Irvine. And the Irvine Conservancy also has some uh, experts who track where it's happening. It's not happening here in the city to date. Uh, if it were, those trees would have to be cut down because once they're structurally compromised, diseased, dead or dying, we remove those trees. Or I send an order saying that remove those trees. But that hasn't happened here yet. The last time I talked with uh, OCFA and the Conservancy, it was in Anaheim Hills up by the Walnut Creek Reservoir. Mm -hmm. Uh, where they had a, a large infestation, uh, but nothing down in, in the Newport area. Okay. Well, I think that's pretty comprehensive overview of things that happened here in town. I'm sure I'll think of another five or six questions after we're done. Yeah. Um, but uh, that, I guess, will end it for today. I appreciate you taking the time to talk with us and, and uh, answer the questions here of our group. Um, we do have some uh, legislative reps uh, that I see here in our participant audience. So we're probably going to segue over to them, but thank you, Dennis. You're welcome. Or I'm not Dennis, but Kevin, <laughs> you're welcome to Dennis Russ's <laughs> name just popped up on my screen. Thank you too, Dennis, for your questions. I appreciate that. Right. Um, and so uh, you're welcome to stay with us or if you need to get on to something else, we, we understand. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot happening over there. Um, yeah, I, I, I've got people staring through my window wanting my help. So <laughs> it is a little. You know, when we built that place, we we put the glass walls in so to have transparency in government. So now you're you're experiencing. Uh, oh yeah, experiencing that. I uh, let's just say there's always somebody who wants something, and they're always peeking through the window. So exactly, <laughs> it, it 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 actually helps. So, anyways, if anybody has any questions or they think of it later. Uh, my uh, my slide deck does have my email address. You're always welcome to get a hold of me. Very good. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Thank Kevin. you very much. So, uh, Alberto, I forgot to uh, comment on your green tie. Looks wow. Like except yeah. for St. Patrick's. Right? Happy yeah. St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. You know, I had a different shirt on this morning. My wife goes, aren't you wearing green? <laughs> <laughs> this is the only green shirt that I have. So I'm wearing it. This is the one day of the year I can wear it and no one says anything. So, all right, well, let's uh, segue over quickly to our uh, representatives. So I'm gonna bring on Matt Kern first. So Matt, get ready. I'm gonna promote you to a panelist so you can- And, and while you're here. doing that, uh, someone, someone asked if the recording is available. So yes, right? It'll be yeah. on the website. Yeah, we're recording this and um, it will be up on our website at newportbeach.com and you'll be able to uh, view it there. So good morning, Matt, how are you today? Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Alberta. How are you all doing today? Morning. 
So um, I just just kind of really quickly, uh, as, if you, as you guys probably know, for the Senate schedule, uh, all of our bills are currently in right now. They just sort of got finalized last week. Uh, just to highlight a couple of the big ones, uh, Senator Men introduced a SB 953, which would prohibit offshore oil drilling off the Orange County coast, um, and it would require the State Lands Commission to terminate all existing leases and uh, uh, ban offshore drilling, and then also offer just compensation. For those so that's a um it's going to be a big lift uh but it's an important bill especially for businesses on the coast because no one likes getting shut down whenever there's an oil spill uh that one's currently in the senate resources and water committee uh so it's sort of working through the policy committee process uh we also had a, a package of bills for survivors before, before you move off that that's just within three miles of the coast though right correct it's within the cal it's in the california jurisdiction and then yeah. There's a federal one, which was something that we can't really get to. Yeah. So realistically, those platforms that are out there, they're all more than three miles out, aren't they? So uh, we've got, I want to say we have three off of the Orange Coast that we would be able to work with. So we're going to kind of do our part. And we're going to hope that the federal will pick up their part for the other platforms. Uh, the issue is with those, of course, you guys, as you all probably know, is that there's just not a lot of actual oil drilling that's going on right there, but they have really uh, high decommissioning cost. And so they sort of are these zombie platforms that business, small businesses don't know what to do with them at this point because the cost of decommissioning is so high, but the cost of an oil spill is significant for uh, coastal businesses. So we're trying to get a solution to that. We should allow them to build homes on those things and then people could have million dollar waterfront homes and that would solve our arena problem that we have here. <laughs> there we go. How about that thinking out of the box, right? How, yeah. <laughs> How far does um, Newport Beach's uh, territory go i don't know we might annex some of those area those platforms if we could build homes on them well there you go okay we well all, we put all home. of our affordable housing out there <laughs> i imagine it'd be extremely <laughs> expensive but yeah <laughs> okay uh, so uh, we have a, a series of bills for domestic violence survivors uh just to highlight a couple of those sb 935 which would allow restraining orders to be renewed as many times as necessary uh, we feel like that was the intention of the legislature originally, but uh, some judges were interpreting it to where they were only allowed to issue one restraining order. And then if the if you know people came back and said, no, I like I need another one, um, they, they would look at the law and there was confusion about if that was possible. So we just want to sort of clarify that. Uh, we also are working on SB 975, which would protect domestic violence survivors and foster youth from facing unjust debt collection when the debt resulted from coercion from their abusers. That one also is gonna be a pretty big lift. Um, it's a fairly significant change in how we do a lot of financial transactions, but it seems like it makes a lot of sense. And it's also sort of in keeping with general theory of contacts, uh, contracts where you know, you, you're not really agreeing to something if you're being coerced into it. Uh, that one is in the Senate Judiciary right now. And then we also have a series of bills on gun safety. Uh, so last year, uh, we passed a bill that would end that ended the sale of firearms and ammunition at the OC fairgrounds. This year, we've introduced SB 915, which would uh, open that up to the entire state. So we're working that through right now, and that's in the Senate Appropriations Committee. And then finally, for the bills I'd like to highlight today, SB 1384, which would require firearms retailers and their employees to meet regular, complete regular training to prevent illegal sales. And that one is over in Senate rules waiting to be referred to the policy committees. So we have a pretty big package this year. There's some of them are gonna be pretty big lift, but we think that's all important. Um, if anyone has any questions about those, of course, reach out to our office. We're always here to, always here to help. Well, Matt, thank you. Um, please pass along to the Senator our sincere thanks for his support of some legislation earlier this week. Uh, that supported basically the entire system, but uh, because of some litigation at uh, our sister campus at UC Berkeley. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll pass that on definitely. We had a couple of bills. I mean, that was one that we were supportive of and also the Cosmos program over at UC that that was a useful program that was helping a lot of kids. And then uh, that was sunsetting. We're trying to get that extended. So that's also in our bill package this year. Well, thank you. We, we take advantage of that program tremendously at uh, UCI. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Thank, well, thank you, you very much you. for the opportunity. All right, Matt, take care. All right, next up is uh, Sergio Prince. Uh, I'm going to promote him to panelists. And Sergio represents Lisa Bartlett's office, our new supervisor for Newport Beach and Costa Mesa as well, I guess, right? That is correct. Uh, Good morning. 
you. Good to see you guys. Can you hear me okay? Yes. So, uh, yeah, I just want to piggyback and wish everyone a happy uh, St. Patrick's Day. I found, managed to find something with green in it myself. So, uh, looking forward to uh, another beautiful day here in um, Orange County. I want to thank uh, um, all the firefighters and Kevin for the fantastic work they did. In fact, the day of the Emerald Fire, uh, I was actually on my way to uh, the Corona Del Mar Chamber meeting and I, I got rerouted as a result of that fire. So we really appreciate them. And that, that, that chamber goes unmentioned here. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, that chamber. That's that like the, you know, they, <laughs> they refer to uh, President Trump as the former guy. Well, they're the, they're the, they're the unspoken of chamber. <laughs> well, the unspoken chamber, I met with them last week too. And, um, and met <laughs> actually, you uh, your city manager, Grace, uh, along, um, uh, outstanding presentation. Uh, it was very nice meeting her. In fact, earlier this week, uh, Supervisor Bartlett in our office met um, with her and um, her meet and greet and with your um, mayor uh, pro tem Noah uh, Blum. That was a Blum or Balloon? Blum. Yeah. Blum. Yeah. Anyway, so <clears throat> they uh, discussed a number of uh, items of uh, mutual interest uh, between the city and the county. And so we're um, looking forward to uh, developing uh, that relationship with you guys and with your city. Um, on that note, uh, yeah, we're looking forward to uh, participating in your upcoming uh, um, Newport Beach uh, Police Appreciation uh, Breakfast. Coming yeah, up don't forget to send me your guest list. <laughs> yes, that's on my to-do list. <laughs> and, you too, Alberto. Uh, I think. Uh, you uh, no, oh, you have it. You've asked right, okay. twice. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so also. Um, Recently, we had the uh, point in time count of the homeless and our office participated in that. And on the homeless front, the, the county was just awarded over $6 million for round two of the uh, state home key program to acquire a hotel in um, Stanton to provide permanent supportive housing for the homeless. That's for round two and round one uh, of the program. Um, the county and Jamboree Housing Corporation were awarded uh, over 23 million as co-applicants for a partnership for um, for hotels in Stanton as well. So um, we're looking for, forward to some progress there. And uh, also, uh, Supervisor Bartlett is going to be having her state of the fifth district on May 5. And um, we're happy to be partnering with uh, your chamber and putting on that event. Um, all of the uh, um, things that I share are in our weekly e-newsletter. It goes out every Friday um, if you'd like to sign up for it. Um, I put my information in the chat and uh, you're welcome to um, reach out to me and I'm happy to sign you up. Um, or you can go online and just sign yourself up but I'll leave that information right there. Thank you. There we go. And that's all I got. All right. Well, we're looking forward to seeing you on the 31st at our police breakfast. I think we're just about sold out on that event. And we're still two weeks out on it. So, so, you know, we get a lot of support from our community. It's almost 500 people um, coming and uh, we appreciate uh, the supervisor um, parting with some of their community uh, event funds to help uh, support that event as well. So uh, we look forward to seeing her there and, and you, I'm assuming you're gonna come as well. So thank you for that. So it looks like uh, we also have someone uh, with us from uh, uh, Congresswoman Steele's office. Justin uh, is here. I'm going to promote him to a panelist list as well, Justin Chang. So you can come on board and let us know what's happening in Washington, D.C. Give us the, the Ukraine update or whatever is uh, motivating Congress these days. <laughs> Right. So um, a couple of things. Well, on the Ukraine thing, uh, I know that President Zelensky from Ukraine did give a virtual speech or hearing to uh, United States Congress yesterday. So um, we'll see what happens with that. I think it's going to be really interesting to see what sort of action they take um, to see uh, what sort of things we're able to push aside to or push towards Ukraine and uh, assistance. To I know we're sending a lot of weapons, but we definitely want to try to do more to support um, our brothers and sisters over in Ukraine. Um, in regards to the Congresswoman's events and legislation, she actually had a woman of distinction night uh, about a few days ago where we honored 18 noteworthy and uh, amazing women who did significant uh, things for Orange County and their community, one of whom was actually a fire chief battalion, I believe, from Laguna Beach. Hmm. 
Um, last week, we held a taxpayer assistance seminar to assist those who are filing taxes, who have questions. We had representatives from the IRS, from Taxpayer Advocates Office, and the United Way VITA program. And we have a lot of other very similar um, seminars and things like that that are free and open to the public. Um, I know for a fact that we are hosting two future federal assistance seminars with um, agencies like Immigration, Department of State, uh, SBA for those who have small businesses, IRS is coming again. Um, so a lot of um, resources that we're trying to provide to the public for free around the county. And um, I believe about a week or two ago, uh, the Congresswoman actually read um, the past officer Vela from Huntington Beach Police Department into the congressional record. So she made a short speech about him on the House floor and it was read into the congressional record and we uh, sent representatives to their mourning and were able to um, provide uh, copies of the congressional records signed by the Congresswoman to the family. So it was a really nice way to honor them and uh, memorialize uh, Officer Vela. In terms of legislation, the Congresswoman is really proud to announce that we have secured $15.5 million of funding for Newport Beach's sand replenishment program. Um, that's something that the Congresswoman has been working for for decades as uh, throughout her career in Orange County. And um, within that bill also, she has actually worked on expanding the Telehealth Expansion Act, which expands the use of telehealth services under the 2020 CARES Act. So um, she has been really happy that we're able to secure that for um, people around the country. And we think it's gonna be really helpful. Um, lastly, a little bit of other legislation. So um, House Amendment 168 HR 4521, which was an amendment to require the United States to seek to require the Chinese Communist Party to match emission car cutting targets established by the United States passed the House last month. We uh, introduced bipartisan legislation with uh, Democrat Susie Lee from Nevada to hire student veterans and try to um, provide a tax credit to businesses that hire part-time veterans. And we lastly, a few weeks ago, we um, introduced legislation to um, secure a interagency task force to address the port backlog. That was HR 585 and that passed the committee and it's waiting to um, be heard on the floor. And that's all from me. If there are any questions, you can feel free to contact our office and I'll put some additional information in the comments too, in the chat box also, I mean. Thank you. Good, well, thank uh, the Congresswoman for the uh, 15 and a half million dollars and Salmon yeah. replenishment. I know Newport Beach, you know, we pride ourselves in having beautiful beaches, but unfortunately, um, they need a little bit of intervention to uh, continually, you know, take the sand out of the river and push it onto the beaches. So uh, it doesn't always happen. Yeah, time. we're trying to fight the erosion that's happening. It's natural erosion. So yeah, um, we want to try to replenish the sand that's being eroded away. Yeah, actually, I cut my teeth on as a city councilman on one. <laughs> it was the first thing I did was a sand replenishment project. Here in West Newport, so I'm very familiar with with those efforts, and we we do appreciate that in Newport Beach. So uh, with that, I don't see any other ledge reps on on the call this morning here in the Zoom meeting. So uh, we're going to conclude with that. Alberto, do you have any any Irish shanty song you want to well, sing? You know, as we exit the the room here, or I I don't, but I have a toast. A toast. We've got okay. a lot of bar. Uh, members of the chamber, so I figured, how about a toast for like bar, Paul? like drinking bar, like like yeah, bar member, bar. like I'm a, an attorney bar. Wow, well, no, probably have a lot of those. Un, both on bar members. Yeah, well, Malarkey's is one of our, uh, and Muldoon's are both chamber members here, so we're all in for St. Patrick's Day. Well, it reads, "May the winds of fortune sail you. May you sail a gentle sea. May it always be the other guy." who says the drinks are on me. <laughs> and on that note, we will see you <laughs> next month. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you, right. uh, Sergio. Take care. Take care.